When was the last time you looked at the state of the world's democracies and genuinely feared for their futures? Well, there are plenty of people who are desperately concerned that Donald Trump has so blown up the conventions and norms that democracies require that we are in for years of hurt. Can this tide be turned around? Lawyer Peter Biro is the editor of a new book called Constitutional Democracy Under Stress, a time for heroic citizenship. He is also founder of an initiative called Section One, which is dedicated to educating people about the existential threats to constitutional democracy. And Peter joins us now from Willowdale in the provincial capital. Peter, it's good to see you again. How are you managing? Nice to see you, Steve. And by the way, congratulations to TVO on 50 great years. Well, aren't you kind? Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, uh, this past weekend, September 27th, we signed on 50 years ago this weekend. I want to read just an excerpt from your book to get us started here, and it goes like this. Democratic backsliding is occurring at a furious pace throughout the West. The causes are many and the reasons are complex, but one thing is certain. Without the heroic engagement of enlightened, principled, courageous, and grateful citizens, liberal democracy's grand promises of freedom, equality, and justice will remain unrealized ideals. Okay, Peter, let's dive into this. I guess any discussion that focuses on this subject really does have to begin with the American president. And I wonder if you could give us, give us one or two examples right off the top here of how you see democracy backsliding in Trump's America. Well, it's, it's certainly backsliding in Trump's America. He is exhibit A uh, for political scientists wanting to identify all of the obvious uh, sort of assaults on 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 the norms of liberal constitutional democracy, uh, the assault on the rule of law, the assault on the independence of the judiciary, uh, the assault on the system of checks and balances, the oversight role of Congress. And of course, most importantly, and this really figures as a kind of thread throughout my, my thinking on the issue, his assault on the truth and on the entire enterprise of truth seeking that ultimately serves to completely undermine and delegitimize what we used to uh, uh, think of as the uh, robust marketplace of ideas so essential to uh, to producing a, so a society, albeit di ideologically and culturally diverse, but that was able to generate consensus across, you know, uh, ideological, partisan, cultural, socioeconomic lines can't do that anymore. How disquieting is it to you that uh, on numerous occasions the president has been offered the opportunity to say, I will respect the results of the election outcome uh, and, and promise the traditional peaceful transference of power if necessary. He's declined to say that when basically every single one of his predecessors has. How big a problem for you? It's a massive problem, but I see that more as a symptom of the underlying problems Again, going back to the problem of truth itself no longer being uh, something that we can all rally around. The shared epistemic foundation so critical to a, uh, a self-governing democratic society, that is a society that shares a deference to fact, uh, knowledge and truth, that's kind of been eviscerated. And what that leads to is a society in which a president can defy all of the norms and all of the conventions. And it, but it's not just that. It's a society in which there is no longer the necessary requisite uh, robust liberal democratic civic culture necessary to keep our political masters in check with the result that a president uh, can say, I'm not going to respect the results uh, of the election and an electorate is not going to be up in arms over it because there is a system of checks and balances that is completely broken and is not responding. So we don't have a kind of responsive democracy where Congress, for example, is calling the uh, the president to account. So what we have is a society uh, in which political parties have now failed to, uh, to fulfill their filtration role of weeding out aspiring autocrats and demagogues. That, that's, you know, that was the, that, that's the story of the 2015 Republican primaries, and here we are. But again, I see Trump's behavior as symptomatic of a deeper uh, underlying problem, you know, and it's, I call it the problem of the, the, the broken uh, system of, of, of confidence in a common epistemic foundation. Others like Ezra Levant, for example, have identified it in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of, um, identity politics, uh, 
so there's a kind of realignment. Others have referred to it as a problem of ideological incoherence. There are a lot of ways to come at this. It's complex, but obviously I'm deeply, deeply troubled by what Trump is doing. Okay, but the, the, let me just for argument's sake throw the argument that I hear from the other side at you, which is, you know, that's just Donald being Donald. He's just mouthing off. He's just trying to get the press's dander going. And uh, of course, if he loses, he'll leave. What's your response to that? My response to that is that if you had a healthy, vibrant civic culture, I wouldn't be as worried about it. The problem is we don't. And that's where the whole issue of heroic citizenship really comes into the piece. And I'm so thrilled that we've got three of my heroes on this panel with us uh, to sort of to, as living, breathing examples of what I'm talking about. But what you need to have is a society that responds to that kind of behavior. So that when you have a, a wild autocrat uh, like that, uh, you know, making those kinds of threats and, in fact, weaponizing the disenchantment in his base. Um, you really have to be worried, not because of what he's doing, but because the rest of us aren't sufficiently educated and conditioned to respond. Those three heroes of yours are still to come. They're standing by. Uh, I'd like you to broaden the lens, if you would, and tell us what other countries in the world you think are particularly at risk for the phenomenon you're describing. Well, I think every democracy is, even our own, and I don't know that I'll have time to come to it. They're all the, the obvious ones that have, you know, def officially defined themselves as illiberal. Orban's Hungary, uh, you know, uh, Erdogan's Turkey, um, and uh, uh, Kaczynski's Poland. But, you know, even in Canada, we've begun to, you know, Canada, which is still uh, something of a refuge in the storm, uh, of populism and of right-wing uh, populism uh, still is is susceptible to all of this because ultimately the popu we're in now a populist moment where facts are no longer the essential building blocks of our discourse. You know, we we, we we're motivated by uh, by other considerations and our leaders and political masters now speak to us not so much appealing to our reason but spe speaking to our identification with certain groups. That's a very, very dangerous trend. So we're susceptible to it here. And I'll just finish with one thing that I think we, we now realize is true. Democracy is neither inevitable nor immortal. Democracies die. They always have. So hmm. the, the effort to redeem the promise of liberal democracy is not an obvious one. And it's not gonna happen by any sort of simple fix. We have to understand the complexities at work here, and then we have to have the courage, the fortitude, and the resources, and uh, you know, to, to then address them. And it's 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 a tough, tough, and not an obvious uh, undertaking. Peter, one more before we get your friends involved, and that is this: we had the Harvard philosopher uh, Michael Sandel on the program last week, and he suggested that, you know, people on the center left, with their focus on credentialism has led to a hubris among this group in our society, and even worse, a humiliation of those who don't have that kind of credentialism. Uh, he, I think he described it as one, one of the last kinds of prejudice or discrimination that's actually allowed in our society uh, is the discrimination against those who have less education than others. And, uh, you know, and he notes that the so-called deplorables are now seeking their revenge. Do you acknowledge that progressive people are partially responsible for the predicament democracies now find themselves in? Progressive people are just as responsible as everyone else for it. They're just as susceptible to this uh, resort to identity politics and to virtue signaling rather than to real engagement across partisan ideological, cultural, and socioeconomic lines. Michael Sandel is absolutely right. Michael Sandel is also known for something, uh, another insight that is absolutely vitally important to this entire discussion, and that is when he puts on his communitarian hat and identifies liberal democracy as being deficient in that it provides no conception of the good life of community and therefore leads to what I refer to as a kind of social cohesion deficit. And credentialism certainly uh, is a problem and certainly justifies resentment on the part of the uh, less well credentialed. There's no question about that. I'm not sure that Michael uh, presents uh, the same sort of solution that I would to that problem. But I, I absolutely acknowledge his insight on that. Okay, let's broaden the discussion because we thought we'd also invite some of the contributors to this book to partake in our conversation as well and examine this from other angles. 
So with that, we also welcome, again, all of them in the provincial capital. In downtown Toronto, there's former MPP Nathalie Desrosiers, now the principal at Massey College at the U of T. In Cedarvale, Karen Mock, human rights consultant and president of J-Space Canada. That's a progressive Jewish nonprofit organization. And in Roncesvalles, or Ronci as they like to call it, Rachel Parent. She's a youth activist, speaker, and founder of the not-for-profit organization Kids Right to Know. They are all contributors to this book we've been discussing, Constitutional Democracy Under Stress, A Time for Heroic Citizenship. Peter Biro, the editor with whom we've just been speaking. Uh, happy to welcome you other three to the program as well. And Karen, maybe we could start with you because apropos of the debate we saw the other night in the U.S., there, um, there seems to be an unwillingness on the part of this president to call out uh, white supremacy, xenophobia, prejudice, and your chapter is about the institutions in Canada which you believe have prevented us from going down that same path. Uh, maybe you could just uh, briefly make the argument as to how you see Canada and its institutions being different? Well, we certainly have the institutions and we certainly have the laws in our Canadian society. I mean, Peter Biro comes out with this amazing project called Section One, all about Section One in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. In my chapter, I point out though, that even though we have the Canadian values, it's not the values that will actually stop the proliferation of hate. And we know that hate and hate crime and xenophobia are on the rise now with this populism. It's not the institutions and the laws and the policies. It's the implementation. It's taking action. It's putting those words into action. I think that Peter is absolutely right. All members of our society are susceptible to this turn of the proliferation of actual lies and non-facts. You know, Goebbels taught everybody very well. If you repeat the half-truths or the lies often enough, people will believe them. And we even heard in that debate the other night, the lies and people are powerless when it's human nature that the more often you hear these lies, the more often you you will believe them. Well, let me follow so, up with this then, Karen, because because this this kind you know I, one of the things I worry about is Canadian smugness on this. There are a lot of people who think, well, it couldn't happen here because we've got the institutions, we have different values from the Americans, etc. This country's got a pretty poor past, though, when it comes to some things. I don't have to tell you about. Canada's poor record during the Holocaust when uh, this, the government of this country turned boatloads of people away, or Japanese Canadians or Italian Canadians who were put in internment camps because the government somehow had thought they had reason to doubt their loyalty. Do we live in a Canada today where that kind of thing would be impossible? It's not impossible. It's very real, and the fear among marginalized, racialized groups is palpable. We hear the anti-immigration rhetoric. As soon as there's a problem in society, as soon as, you know, right now, God forbid, we're in the middle of a pandemic, as soon as there's a, there's a pandemic, then the scapegoats, the Jews are blamed, the Chinese are blamed, anti-black racism is on the rise. And of course, you reminded me, and I can always count on you, Steve, all of those other features are documented in my chapter. Mm -hmm. our, our abysmal history in the way we've treated immigrants, in the kinds of laws that used to be on the books. But the systemic racism, the systemic anti-black racism, the Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, <clears throat> indigenous issues, anti-Aboriginal people, these issues are still palpable in Canada today. Do we still live in the best country in the world? I'm sorry, uh, you know, you can't call me a nationalist in, in, the, in the pejorative sense of the word, but I thank God every day that we're in this country, and as Peter Biro has sent the rallying call, we need to take heroic action now, or continue to take heroic action, building allies. I've said that our Canadian society, and to counter hate and xenophobia, in today's world is about protection, 
prevention and partnership, protection of the law, but the real implementation with, without discrimination against any group. Education is the prevention and education at every single level of the system, countering systemic discrimination, systemic racism in the criminal justice system, in the education system, in the health sector, all that is documented in my chapter. And of course, partnerships, building allies, not just allies in any kind of a patronizing sense, but in an activism sense to take action with allies in the struggle for human rights, freedom, and to preserve democracy. Okay. It's fragile. Let me get Nathalie Desrosiers now into our discussion. Bienvenue, madame. It's a great pleasure to see you again. You are a constitutional scholar, so no surprise that your chapter of the book focuses on Section 1 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And I want to know, in your view, has that section, enumerating all of the rights that we enjoy as Canadians, has that, in some respect, protected us from this kind of democratic backsliding that Peter described happening in the United States and elsewhere in the world today? Certainly, I think it, it is a sign of a mature democracy when you have a robust protection of rights that allows for a dialogue between the judiciary and, and, and the government on how to achieve some goals. So I think it's a strength of our system that we have uh, the charter and that we have uh, been committed to, to the charter. Now, it does not protect us completely, and that was the point of my chapter, because at that time, I was reacting to the fact that Francois Legault in Quebec and, and uh, Doug Ford in Ontario had threatened, uh, Francois Legault did use the notwithstanding clause to say, your rights don't exist because I know best. And I think that's that's what the fear here, is we should not, we should continue to insist on a mature democracy that protects rights. It's, it's what Karen talks about. It's part of the legal infrastructure. A mature democracy welcomes this sort of check and balances that come from the fact that you can go to court and get yourself protected. Now, there's a lot of worries about the backsliding of democracy because of the behavior of some leaders like uh, Trump, but also because there's a fear that we do not respond fast enough and uphold uh, the, the, the democratic ideals and act on it as a society. And I think Karen's chapter is, is a good one uh, to point out on this. I would just want to say that one of the issue, and I think you've alluded that in your introduction, one of the issue is for a long time, we say that uh, democracy is about abstract principle, you know, the presumption of innocence and and sometimes, you know, if you have a black man being shot seven times as a, upon arrest, how can you believe in the presumption of innocence if that occurs? So the, the, the discrepancy between what's written in the Constitution and what happens on the ground, I think, has come back to haunt us. And I think we have to be particularly demanding of compliance with the, with the principles of our Constitution. It cannot... Be, if you have a rule of law, you cannot just have, have it ignored uh, um, on the ground. Natalie, I do want to follow up on one thing you said there, because, you know, if we go back to 1981, 82, and mm -hmm. the constitutional negotiations that took place that eventually got us the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, yeah. it never would have happened had all of the ministers and the prime minister not put a little water in their wine, and that water was you referred to it, the notwithstanding clause, that notwithstanding all the rights we have in the Constitution and in the Charter, you know, parliaments can set aside those rights for a period of time, I think five years, if they, in their wisdom, decide that they know better. What's your view on whether or not a mature 153-year-old democracy ought to still have a clause like that in its Charter? There's no problem with the clause. It's, it's when do you decide to use it? And I think one of the danger is that, uh, it, and that is that you would use it preemptively. You would not allow people to just get their rights uh, discussed in courts, but you say, uh, I can do it because I can, because it's written there and I can do it without, and, and uh, you know, uh, disregard the rights for five years. That's a danger. It was meant to be used, and I, over time, since 1982, it was meant to be used 
in a very, uh, only on certain cases, very, very seldomly, and it's a big deal, as opposed to trying to normalize this exercise. And that was, I, I was reacting to that in that chapter. It is not normal to decide to uh, say to people for five years, I'm not going to have any rights to the court. It's in extreme circumstances only that it should be used. And only after the courts have decided the case so that then you can say, yes, uh, there's a, a debate between the courts and the, and, the, and the government and the government is elected. So it must have the final say, but it should not be the first answer or the first reflex. That was my point. Understood. Okay, Rachel, you're batting clean up here. Here we go. You write uh, that um, to be young today is to be an activist. Let's start there. What do you mean by that? Well, we're in this midst of an equal breakdown that we have simply never seen before. People my age are not only fighting because we feel that we have to, we simply don't have a choice. Uh, and that's that's really because look around us. We've been given the ultimatum that we have 11 years to turn our ecological system around to prevent climate change from getting worse. We've been told that corporations are polluting our planet, are poisoning our food with pesticides and herbicides. And... All of this is culminating in this time where there's urgency. And so to be young today is to be an activist, because if we aren't an activist, ourselves and all of future generations are going to be severely impacted. At what age did you get this spirit of activism going in your life? I started at age 11, uh, sort of by accident. I found out about GMOs and our greater food system and the impacts they were having on our health, on our environment, on pollinators, even our soil and climate. And at that point, I found out that GMOs weren't labeled in Canada and the U.S. In fact, we're the only two industrialized nations in the entire world that don't require mandatory GMO labeling. And I felt that right there, that was simply going against our constitutional right and democratic freedoms to choose the food that we put in our own bodies. And this is simply because corporations pay millions of dollars to prevent uh, us from having the right to know and the right to choose what we put in our bodies. So that's where my activism came from, and that's developed into making the connections between our climate and our food system and realizing that we all have a part to play in the solutions as well. GMOs meaning genetically modified organisms that, uh, that, that some manufacturers use to keep food fresher longer. That's the argument that they use. Tell us about uh, Kids' Right to Know. This is a group that you're intimately involved with. What's that all about? Absolutely. So Kids Right to Know is our nonprofit organization, and we focus on teaching kids about the importance of healthy eating and the impacts that our food has on the world around us. We really want to bring back the connection of young people to nature. We have technology developing at such uh, fast and incredible rates at the point where our government doesn't even understand how to properly regulate, especially with genetically modified foods and new gene edited varieties that will be coming out all the time. And really the purpose of these foods uh, is not so much to remain fresher longer, but it is in fact to be able to sell with herbicides and pesticides. Uh, so it's a wonderful profit machine, but it is impacting our ecological systems to measures that we can't even understand yet. And uh, that's why we found a kid's right to know not only to teach kids about our food, teach what nutrition and health means, uh, but also teaching about our environment, how we can be a part of the solutions, and demanding more for our government so that they're looking out for us and not the corporations. Okay, in this book, uh, you three additional authors have laid out in your chapters uh, other areas where you see democratic backsliding and things that concern you. And now I wanna get to the part of our discussion where we're gonna say, okay, and therefore, what? Now, Peter, what you have called for, as the subtitle of the book suggests, is a more heroic and a more enlightened citizenship that will go out there and fight for democracy. And I want to know what that actually looks like. Go ahead. Well, what it looks like is uh, a citizenry that is uh, conditioned uh, to come to the rescue uh, and, and to uh, promote and advance political liberty. Uh, and uh, the starting point to create a citizenry that is capable of, of assuming its responsibilities as you know in a democracy starts with our education system. Uh, so once again, the solution is not easy, it's not quick, it's not obvious. We need a robust civics education program that is not uh, reduced to reducible to a single course or a couple of courses in high school. It's got to run 
sort of uh, to be a thread that runs through the entire educational system that, uh, that uh, addresses uh, students and citizens, not just on an intellectual level, but also on a visceral level. So that is first and foremost. And, and we need students to be conditioned both intellectually and viscerally into, uh, into an understanding of what I call my secular decalogue uh, of fundamentals uh, that underpin liberal constitutional democracy. The other thing that we absolutely have to do is to address the problem of exponentially increasing uh, inequality, economic inequality, both as to income gaps and, of course, more importantly, as to wealth disparities that have a tremendously destabilizing uh, impact on society and that you know ultimately represent a major betrayal of the bag of social welfare promises that liberal democracy in the post-war period uh, was all about. All right, let me pick up on the education angle there and go to Nathalie de Rosier, because of course you run one of this country's finer educational institutions in Massey College. And I do remember a poll not that long ago among young people, which said that they were not all that fussed about democracy and didn't fear, you know, authoritarianism or totalitarianism as much as people of our age who grew up during the Cold War surely did. And I wonder, the students, when they get to you, what do, what do you see in them that concerns you that they're not as in love with and prepared to work hard enough for democracy as maybe you'd hope? Well, I think the reason why they are not in love with democracy is a little bit what I talked about, is because of the failure of democratic countries to have achieved and delivered on the principles of equality, for example. So if you see such discrepancy between what's written and what is lived, then you start to say, well, is that such a good system after all? So my sense is that it's incumbent upon us to continue to fight, not only to have the civil and political rights, but also the socioeconomic rights. That's the, that's the new venue for a democratic in, engagement. It has to be core to our, our, our commitment, and that's what Peter is talking about. If you're not going to resolve the equality, you've abandoned the idea of what democracy was for. It was about the equality of all to participate in decision making. So, I, and I think that's, that's what's happening. And this call for action that the young people are saying is that I, unless you are delivering, then, you know, watch out, democracy may no longer be one thing that we want to fight for. So I think that the, the reflex is not to blame them, but to respond to the call for action. All right, let's pick up on that call for action. Karen, uh, you know, I, I, I looked at, I read your chapter. I've read all the chapters that all of you have written here. And, and they're thoughtful, they're scholarly, you, you make great arguments. Um, but I want you to speak to the person either watching this program or listening on podcast right now and tell them, here's one tangible thing you can do in your daily lives to ensure that democracy in Canada doesn't slide backwards. What would you suggest? I would suggest that they have got to understand what fact-checking and truth-telling is all about. And it's not just somebody's version of the truth. We know that perception is huge. We know that different narratives, different lived experiences give people um, a different take on life. If, if someone has abused <clears throat> power, and once they have power, are going to do anything they can to hang on to it, those that have been abused have an entirely different experience. And we have in our, in our country uh, a real thread of white supremacy and a resistance, a resistance for people to even listen and try to understand and accept that facts are facts. We even have some organizations being created saying that they have the truth and then they go into only their version of history. So my one thing that I would want people to do, well, it's got to be more than one and it's got to be different things from different people. Um, but the one thing is that the democracy is so fragile 
you brought up the issue of the lessons of the Holocaust. One thing we learned is that it's the democratic institutions that have to be strengthened. Goebbels taught us you exploit democracy at its weakest link, and when you gain power, you can eliminate democracy. So education, for sure, at every level of the system and of all the system. But the one thing is also putting the words into action and recognizing that it's not just about human rights and equality for your own group, but understanding that all the same theories apply to yourself as a consumer of information and propaganda. And so we need to live, live and practice what we preach and we need to put our theories, our policies, our laws into practice for the benefit of all Canadians. Rachel, let me uh, next go to you. And I, I, listen, let me tell you right off the top, I'm so deeply impressed with your commitment. And when I meet people like you, uh, I, I feel very good about the future and that your generation is going to fix uh, the world and all the screw-ups that my generation made. Having <laughs> said that, I don't want to idealize this because I do meet a lot of uh, younger people as well who seem completely apathetic about things and, um, you know, are not engaged and certainly take a lot of what they see around them now for granted and don't think that in the future they're going to have to work for it. Uh, mm -hmm. What would you say to them? I think all young people have a passion somewhere. And I, I think a lot of what we see right now with apathy is a system that has created that in terms of we are constantly bombarded with news, with media, uh, about our impending futures that don't look so great in this moment. And it's easier sometimes to check out than a day's action. But what I found keeps you motivated, what keeps you hopeful, what, what brings um, you out of that apathetic state is taking action and becoming active. So I encourage anyone who is facing burnout or apathy or, or any of these types of feelings to get involved and find something that you deeply care about and take action because we need everyone and not just young people. I think that's that's something that's really been perpetuated in the past few years that it's young people will save our world and we only depend on young people. But the reality is, is that we need every single person, regardless of age, regardless of background, uh, regardless of where you live in the world, to become involved, because this is not a one generational issue. This spans our entire world. We are all facing climate change issues. We are all facing food issues. We are all facing um, some social, economic, uh, social justice issue within our own communities. And so it's time that we all help each other out. It's time that we all become active because there isn't time to wait anymore. And I think that's the one that I have to say to anyone out there is become involved regardless uh, of where you may be in life because there is a space for you in activism. That's Rachel Parent, founder of Kids Right to Know. We also want to thank Karen Mock from JSpace Canada, Natalie Desrosiers from Massey College, and Peter Biro, the founder of Section One and the editor of this book that um, one hopes will uh, cause people to give uh, a great deal of thought. And second, and third thought too, constitutional democracy under stress, a time for heroic citizenship, um, if not now, when? Thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate you coming on to TVO tonight. Thanks so much, Steve. Thank you so much. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.